Dennis first. with you. Holland is so much easier to say than the Netherlands. Actually, it's easier to say the Netherlands. Easier to say it your way than the, the American way. Yeah. I get so many weird emails from music stuff. Good morning, Roger. Good to see you. How many do we have on? Still very early. Isn't it, are people not getting that? Should I do a Discord uh, notification? I'm just going to say, yo, where is everybody? Yo. Let's see, general, uh, general chit-chat probably is the busiest of those. Yo. Where is everyone? <laughs> now they're going to think I want to, I'm on, I'll just say live streaming so they know. Oftentimes, though, when we have these slow starts, just a couple people, it, it ends up being a big day. Now, I have to leave at 11. I've got a meeting at 11, but um, maybe a little before. But, but we'll, we'll get done what we're going to do. Um, and maybe what we'll do next Monday is a review of all these. Because I, I want you to kind of understand the cage method. And, and then maybe we can, hey, David Sillers, maybe we can also... Um, uh, you know, it'll help uh, ho hopefully get you to the point where you can see how it's all connected, start to see the neck. That's really the reason for the me the, the caged method is for, for the mystery of the guitar neck to kind of start to be revealed. Um, and if we, you know, go back to what was this one here? Yeah. That, that, those diagrams, uh, which I believe Holly put all in one PDF. Hi, Tony Hall. Good to see you. John, good to see you in Louisville. Yeah, I know. Americans just say the Holland. I, I, I've been explaining the difference between the Netherlands and Holland, but it's, Holland's a smaller a part of the Netherlands, correct? Netherlands are bigger than Holland. You see, my fan now, I'm one quarter Bohemian, and Bohemia doesn't even exist. Uh, it became part of Austria and part of the Czech Republic. So, so it's, it's got, I've got kind of a, a weird lineage. Uh, but the cool thing about these diagrams is I, I did, you can see the very first chord in each of the five diagrams. If you look at it, it spells out the word caged. C, and then there's an A chord, and there's a G chord, then there's an E chord, and there's a D chord. And, and then from there, it, you can see if you stay on any one of them, you spell out the word caged starting on the C. See, the, the, it looks orange to me, but it's supposed to be red. But the red, then the blue, then the green, then the yellow, and the purple. So today, we're on the purple. See, look, we've already got 
a lot more people than we had two minutes ago. Oh, maybe not. That's weird. It says 10. I mean, I see 12 names in the, in the chat. So, okay. So if we go to today's lesson, you see this one long little D shape here. Hey, Holly. You know, Tony Hall, <laughs> that's a common complaint uh, for uh, anybody, you know, guitar against guitar players. Um, and there, you know, it's seriously though, if I start to play, you know, when I was a kid, everybody was like, oh, that's so great, oh man, oh yeah, that's awesome. You know, and then, but the last thing they want me to do is to play the entire eight minute song. <laughs> with all the repeats and this, you know, and I know that, so then the next thing I know, I'm going, you know, I'm playing. And then they're like, oh, that's cool. Play that song, you know. And eventually at some point they go, well, you never finish a song. And it's like, you really wouldn't want me to, unless you're gonna sing it or somebody's gonna sing it. It's kind of boring to go, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, shoot. It's kind of like, you really want to hear all of that, or the you know, <laughs> you generally don't. Um, it's that's why it's more fun to play with a singer, you know, someone who's going to sing songs. I have a friend though that knows songs and he knows them all all the way through, and everybody will he'll sing them and sing along, and so he's great at parties. I'm I'm that guy that can like okay, I'll, okay, now I'm bored, you know, now I'm going to play. With it. And. Uh, and if I'm hired to play the party, then I play complete songs. Um, you know, I used to be occasionally would play at Christmas parties or um, uh, I don't know if I ever told you my Oral Hershiser story. Probably. Freebird, exactly. People yell Freebird. And then, you know, they, they yell it. They put up their lighters, they yell, Freebird, Freebird, and the band starts Freebird. And then before the song ends, they're already halfway home in their car. <laughs> it's like, well, why did you ask for Freebird if you're going to leave? I didn't know it was a 27-minute long song. Oh, it's like Whipping Post. <laughs> Would anybody request Whipping Post? <laughs> uh, I'd be up there, I'd be like, I'll play Whipping Post only if you stay for the entirety of the song. And I'd be like, okay, never mind. <laughs> Don't do Whipping Post. If you don't know, Whipping Boss was an Almond Brothers from Fillmore, Fillmore East, and it was the entire side of one album. Hey, Sadie, welcome back. Oh, oh, that's funny. You were, you were like, I'm going to catch up on Tom's cage method lessons, and then lo and behold, here I am. Yeah, and you could watch any of these in any order. These, you know, because we're kind of concentrating on one shape. And this, obviously, today we're, we're, we're working on the, the D shape here. Okay, so we're we're to the last letter of the of the, um, uh, of the word cage, um, and I don't know if you can see that little R in the middle of that. You know, I should have made it a lighter purple so you could see that R. But anyway, there's the R. That's the root. So when you play a D chord, that's a D right there. Okay, so is this. And we're gonna look at that one in a second. We're gonna look at that one in a second, but. But this is a D. So whatever note that is, that's what major triad these three notes are. Okay? So we go, um, after D in the alphabet is E, well, D to E is a whole step. So that would be two frets on a guitar. Okay? After E in the alphabet is F, and E to F is one of our half steps. Okay? So that would be one fret. So there's F, and that's where we're going to be today. Okay? But to continue this, um, E to G is a whole step. So there's G. Okay? In fact... That, that's that's a little uh, a D triad, obviously, right? But it's a G chord. And then when when uh, Jimmy Page goes to this chord, it's that's a um, uh, that would be an A form, and that's a D chord and a C chord right there. So and I, all of that with a D in the bass, I'm pretty sure. So, um, but yeah, so you can take this all the way up. There's A, B flat, B, C, and there's D. We're all the way up an octave from here. Okay. So, but now we're, we're going to be at, at the fifth fret, essentially, and that's the F, uh, that's an F triad, okay? 
So we're going to use, we're going to learn the pentatonic shape and the diatonic shape around um, this chord. But you remember, you got to think of it as being this chord moved up, okay? So I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit more notes here in the triad um, so that, um, let's see, yep, you can see. Now, this is not a chord you have to be able to play, okay? Again, we I've talked about this before. Sometimes, oh, shoot. Sometimes you're like, oh, how, how do I, I can't play that. Yeah, you don't need to play it. You just need to visualize it, okay? And so there's, you can still see the little little D shape there, but now I've filled it out. So this would be as if I took a D over F sharp and moved it up, okay? So let me stay on here in case I get any questions. How do you spell caged again? Okay, Jeff. Wah, wah. And Inagata de Vida is supposed to be in the Garden of Eden, right? But he just was so drunk or something, he slurred it and just was like, oh, that's cool, that's better. Um, Mambo, I am off. I will watch this when uh, up. We'll watch this when I'm back in Germany. Okay, see you next week, Mambo. Mambo. So, you know, sometimes you play this D chord and sometimes you want that F sharp in the bass. And that's one way to play. So that's kind of what's happened here. I've moved that chord up to here with the bar. <laughs> so it's not really physically playable, right? I can't, it can't, it can't be, well, it could be done, I suppose, if I could bar this and get, no, I can't. So, but that's a more theoretical shape. Be, be, um, uh, know that those are there. So you got the triad and then you got the root here and then the fifth and there's the third. Uh, so actually, technically, these bottom three notes is also a triad. Okay. In fact, that's that's the third, the uh, root and the fifth. I'm sorry, the uh, third, fifth, and root. Right? That's like playing this, like the top three notes of an E chord. If I go up a fret, A C F A C F. So there's your triad there, and here's a triad here. So you got two triads. But the reason I want you to see this is so that you can get to the point where by visualizing that, you have 50% of the major pentatonic, which is the first scale we're going to work on. Now, remember when we talked about pentatonics and I said, this pentatonic is the number one pentatonic because it's the best pentatonic. It's what everybody uses. It's got three minor or yeah, three minors or blue blues roots. It's got three major roots. It feels good on the hand. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you remember that, but that was back, uh, it came up. Uh, Bruce posted the, um, the I think I, I mentioned a couple days, ago, a couple weeks ago, and Bruce happened to mention uh, the series on pentatonic scales. I'm, I, I recorded a video on for the pentatonic thing, and I just couldn't, I really got to formulate it. It's a, that's a tough one. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're right. Okay, sorry about that. I, I changed this from, let me fix that. Uh, but it's two, two, is he said 225? I'll confirm that here. Um, but th this pentatonic scale that we're going to learn right now is the, the least of the pentatonics, let's say. Uh, one of the reasons is, oh, you're right. Okay. Lesson. So that's okay. No caps. Lesson two, two, five. Okay. Sorry. Uh, that, thanks for catching that. Um, so we're going to learn this pentatonic and this in the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, or in my numer, numerization of those pentatonic scales, um, it was pentatonic number three, just in order. Okay. Um, and again, pentatonic number one was this one. That I did do a video a while back on your first pentatonic scale. Um, I met, you know, I could do five videos. It would be easier in some ways to do five videos and it would give me more content. And I'd probably get more views if I had five shorter videos than one really long video because I wanted to show, but I also wanted to show how they're all connected. And um, so... But as we go up the scales, we do pentatonic one, pentatonic two. Don't worry about it. No quiz here. Everybody take a sip. 
There will not be a quiz on this. Take a celebratory sip in our drinking game. Mm. I just touched my nose a second ago. Did you catch that? People aren't paying attention anymore. Uh, and I have no alcohol in that, so it's not that kind of drinking game. Oh, I just touched my nose again. It itches. Okay, we're going to see a lot of cups and stuff here in the, in the chat. Um, but when you go up and do Pentatonic 2, and then Pentatonic 3 was the one that had, so it had only two blues roots and two, two major roots, and it, it had a shift in it. It was the only of the, of the five pentatonic scales that had a shift. Now, just so you know, when you're done here, when we're, we're done here, look, we've done this one. There's a pentatonic shape. That's pentatonic number four. Um, that's pentatonic number five. There's pentatonic number one. There's pentatonic number two, and here's pentatonic, well, not yet, soon. I'm going to put it right now. Uh, but pentatonic number three. All right. And again, those numbers are my numbers. They're just the order they appear in, starting with the first one, okay? There's no, there's no, uh, <laughs> thanks, Sam. <laughs> it's, it's not like official nomenclature or anything like that. Okay. So now I've got to go here. I'm going to grab, I think this is what I want. So here's pentatonic number three positioned around the D, that D shape. Go like that. So there it is. You can see I have the letters down here for major diatonic. But, um, okay. Um, so you can see it, it looks like a really simple pentatonic except for that little shift. You can see there are two purple notes with an R in them. Um, and that, those would be the major roots. The minor roots would be the Ds, which would be uh, this note here, the third fret on the second string, and here. So if you wanted to you know, think of this as a minor pentatonic, you could think of it as D minor pentatonic. And again, the fingering on this is kind of dealer's choice. Um, the... Um, Okay, but I was just messing around with this pentatonic and, and with the diatonic that's going to be here in a second. Um, and I, I, I realized I use this a lot, okay, so it's not, a, 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 I, I like this, you know, like if I'm in the key of F. So I'm doing like a one, six, four, five, or one, six, two, five progression. So I'm going like F to D minor, G minor, to like B flat over C, which sounds a lot harder than it is. <laughs> you could go to C there, or C sus, or C7 sus. I should write a pop song around that. It's so cheesy, but kind of fun. Um, but I would often, there's that root, see that, that R right there? Boom. And just grab that F right there. Boom. And then you've got the fifth here and the sixth. You go. Almost like you're playing your horn section. Okay, that's a great little thing to grab. It's really fun in the hands, and you get go ahead and play it. You can even sing it. Thanks, to Bruce, for putting the Discord link up there. If you're new, I'm not sure if we've had anybody new here this morning. Uh, you might be lurking. Oh, the count went down. Uh, let's see. Pin. I'm going to pin this message. All right. So. <laughs> You can 
got a... Hey, Pepper. You just have fun around that. And, and, and on those chords, the F and the D minor and the G minor 7 and the B flat over C, there's an F in every one of those notes. Um, that I, I may have done a video a long time about, ago, I think about coming up with rhythm parts. I, uh, uh, I did a series on that a long time ago, very early series. And, um, you know, there were times, there's times where you're, if you're playing like in a gospel setting, man, the chords are constantly changing, right? I mean, they're just like... Mm -hmm. can't keep up and you know piano players can just are just going crazy and guitar players are like I don't know what you're doing well you pick the key you find the key if it's you know like C or whatever you do you just Michael Jackson it you know Jackson 5 chances are you find the root you find the root of that and no matter what they're doing it, how busy they are on the piano and how busy the chord progression is you can just kind of and if the note doesn't work then just go down a, a, a scale tone in the case of C, it would be going down to. Uh, I'll just stay in F. So what I'm playing there is I'm playing this F and this F, and then I'm just muting everything else. So that way I can get this good scrapey sound. And that's your Jackson Five octave kind of vibe. But it doesn't really matter what the chords are. And then if if a note if it's if it's rubbing the wrong way, then you might probably that note will work. Or go back, and then you can go back. Um, or if you want, you go up two two frets to the the, the G note, um, and those are both scale tones in the in the key of F. So, um, okay. So let's play this pentatonic right now. We're going to start with the bottom string, and we're going to be at third fret. Damn, my nose is so itchy. Just the outside, not the inside. Just the outside is itchy. <laughs> okay. The uh, so first finger on the third fret of the bottom string, then third finger on the fifth fret, and we're gonna do that three times. So, so that's pretty easy. In fact, I would do that and resolve to that F because that's what key we're in. Technically. Okay. Oh, and the notes in the, the F major pentatonic are F, A, G, uh, sorry, F, G, the two, A, the third, C, the fifth, and D the, the sixth, okay? One, two, three, five, and six. That's true for all major pentatonics. One, two, three, five, six. Okay, so we're gonna get to that part in a second, but. I mean, that's just a, that's a great R&B vibe right there. Just playing that much of that, that pentatonic. Now, if we, as we continue, we go, First finger here, third finger, and now we gotta move down. See, this is why this is one of the lesser pentatonics, because we have a shift. Um, so we're gonna put our first finger here, because we can play this with the second finger and pinky, right? Go less dominant fingers, but we're still gonna have a shift when we come to here. So why not just go ahead and play these, these this group of notes here with dominant fingers, and then do the shift, and then we'll just shift twice, okay? But again, it's like I said, it's dealer's choice. However you want to finger the scale is how you want to do it. So we're in F. We're in F major. Um, so now we're down here at the first finger on the second fret of the third string, the A note. Then we're going to reach up and get that C. And we're going to we're going to slide up again. Exactly. No fourth and no seventh in a pen major pentatonic. We get we add those to get the diatonic scale. Okay, so we have, let's practice this little snippet, okay? So one, three, or one, four, one, four, but the frets are two, five, three, six. And again, we're ending on, that's the root, okay? That's a little, very hard to see little R there on the purple note. It'd be like doing this. I mean, there's a real practical, uh, now I'm, I'm adding a note here, but play this. There's our flat three, there's our A flat, which is a flat three, going to the third, okay? And then we're going here, uh, first fret, uh, first finger, sorry, third fret of the fifth string, and then fifth, uh, fifth fret, and then the F note on the third fret. So we, okay, that's kind of like this. 
It's kind of the same lick, but that's country sounding. And this is that's kind of R and B or blues sound. You swing it. Uh, sounds like a kind of a big band vibe, right? And that's so we go. If we want to do that with this lick, right? With our with our index and pinky shift here. If we want to get that flat third, we're going to have to go down one more fret. So just reach down to get that A flat with your first finger and then there and then finish it out. Now, I'd probably more likely if I saw it on paper, I'd probably go, okay? But demonstrating this scale. But we just kind of want to practice this little shift here so it feels natural eventually. It won't happen today, but eventually we'll. Hey, Bart, John Bart, John Brat loves guitar videos. <laughs> oh, um, what sounded like Beatles long ago? Long, long time. I'm trying to think of what that would be. Okay, then we have, we just finished it off with the last two notes are the same as the bottom two notes here. Third fret and fifth fret. Again, it's dealer's choice, however you want to finger it to, to, you know, and do I hang out in this scale? No, but I love this, this shape. The shape is great. So knowing that shape is huge. I even used it this weekend at church, you know, like if the song goes from F or C to F, C to G, you can, you can get a nice, you can, or it goes A minor to F to C. To, to G or something, you can get a lot of cool. You know. Whatever, you know, something. You can really use that. Oh, Chucky's in love. Right, that's right. Yeah. Exactly, that's exactly. Yep. Yeah, so the, it's just a classic blues lick. Very, very um, horny. <laughs> it would be a horn section lick, so it's, ergo, it's horny. <laughs> Horn-like. Hornish. Hornish game hen. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm really just here to entertain myself. If, if nobody was watching, I wouldn't be any different of a person, because I'm really only trying to make myself laugh here. You know that, right? Okay, so now let's get the major diatonic in here. We kind of spent some time on the major pentatonic. Oh, geez. and I do have to leave at 11 today or a little before because I got a I got a meeting with a young cellist that wants to be a session player and a composer. So I told her I would. She wanted to meet with me and get you know pick my brain. So I like to do that with young people, help them out. Hey, if she ends up becoming a famous composer, maybe she'll hire me. So, uh, okay, that's what I'm going to tell her anyway. Like, you become famous. I want you to become a very successful composer, and then uh, and then I can work for you. Her <laughs> favorite annoying little brother. Right? I'm totally annoying. How's it going in there? Holly. Is that, is that your husband's socks over the chair behind you? <laughs> uh, sorry. Hey, Bob Schumann. What's going on? Anyone who tuned in right then would be like, the heck is this? Of course, that's pretty much the case. <laughs> Anytime anyone tunes in to this live stream. Okay, so the first diagram was just showing you... That, I, that wasn't, I used my nail. My, my flesh didn't hit flesh, so there was no COVID transmission here. Okay, so COVID can't live on nails, fingernails. Um, and now I'm gonna have a, and I'm gonna have a disclaimer on my video by YouTube. <laughs> um, so we take this D shape and 
and we moved it up. And so we're, we're talking about the D shape and the cage method. Okay. And then if I want to fill that out visually, I would want to see all of the triad notes, maybe one, one note of a triad on each string. And, and when you see that, you've already got, if you look at that bottom diagram on your left, um, you would see a, um, 50% of the major pentatonic. So if you look at the major pentatonic, there are, there are, thir uh, there are six purple notes and there are six black notes. Okay. Um, <laughs> you didn't get the screenshot, did you? Um, so, um, so there's, well, you can, you can roll back and get the screenshot. You know that, right? Um, but there are, so you can see there's six. So basically when you, when you visualize this, the, the D shape, the fullness of the D shape up here at any position, really, um, when you, once you, if you can visualize that and see it, you've already got 50% of the major pentatonic. If you've got the major pentatonic down, now you've got five sevenths of the major diatonic down. Okay. I'm tempted to go another round through all the cage methods and show you the blues pentatonics over each of these. Um, what I would be probably do in that scenario is I would take every one of these chords, okay, so again, cage, so here's C, I would show, we do C7, okay, then A, here's A7, and then uh, G, G7, E, E7, D, D7, and if we did them all in the, the, the sevens, then that would you would you would be more likely almost instead of playing the major pentatonic over you would more likely maybe if it was you were playing over C seven you'd be more likely to play with the minor pentatonic right because it would imply a blues progression so these using a major pentatonic and a major diatonic don't necessarily um, discount the possibility of using these over the blues um, I use major pentatonics and major diatonics all the time over the blues. Not a major diatonic, not so much. Uh, I would use a, a diatonic scale, but not major. I would use a what we would use as an, a mixolydian scale, remember? And that would be a major scale with a flatted seventh. So here's the major scale. Okay. So if I play R to R, that's an, uh, that's an F major scale. Right there. But if I take the seventh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and go to flat it down a step, then I get, that's a Mixolydian scale. And so that works much better over, over an F7 in this case. Okay, so, yeah, we gotta watch the language, okay? This is a, this is a rated G for, for guitar players. <laughs> Okay, now um, so let's um, let's try let's try to play this major diatonic. Sorry, my arm is making it hard to read the word diatonic. There we go. I got too much light in here, I think. So um, let's try that scale. So we did the major pentatonic. So we're gonna play on the bottom string. We're gonna go. Dennis is saying, I, I am amazed at how, how the heck I fit my big head of mine on the tiny cell phone screen. And I can't believe you're watching this on a cell phone screen. Those dots must be really tiny. Okay. So there's our first three notes of this scale. Okay. So uh, first finger, third finger, fourth finger on the third fret, fifth fret, and sixth fret. So I'm going to give you fret numbers for now. We're going to go up and down using just fret numbers. Then I'll do finger numbers. And then we'll do letter names. How about that? Okay. Here we go. Three, five, six. Then three, five. Shift down a fret and go two, three, five. And then again, two, three, five. Okay. Then we're going to shift again and we're going to go uh, three, five, six and three, five, six. So we really, we have a lot of three, five, sixes there. So as far as fitting in your hands, it's, and remember where the root is. If you're going to noodle around just to try to get these scale shapes down, try to land on that root every now and then and just kind of finish the phrase on the root, just so 
uh, you can kind of keep centering that root because the root is going to not only be the safest home place to land, it's also going to be the way you're going to move this scale around, okay? So, for example, if I want to uh, play this in A, then I put my pinky on A and I play that scale. And then now I'm in the key of A, okay? So there's a couple reasons why you want to kind of emphasize the root when you're just kind of noodling. Again, it kind of centers. Um, it's totally true when I play the oud, right? Okay, everybody get ready to take a sip. Because I... Uh, I mean, the interesting thing about the oud is that the bottom three strings are D, in this tuning, they're D, G, and A. So one, four, five. So I got the, I got the one chord. So I hit that low note and I tuned it up. Kind of. Okay, and then if I want to do some stuff on the four chord, I hit that. So that's kind of the same thing. You know, when you center yourself on the root, when you center yourself on that root, it kind of it kind of reminds you what your what key you're playing in or what chord you're playing over. Okay, yeah. So everybody take a sip, and now another instrument change. So two sips. It's one of our drinking game rules. So. Okay, so let's do, I'm going to give you fret numbers for descent for descending on this scale. We're going to go 6, 5, 3, 6, 5, 3, and then we're going to shift down a fret and go 5, 3, 2, 5, 3, 2, and then again, dealer's choice here. If you want to reach up and get this next two notes, starting with your third finger, you can totally do that. I would probably, i probably do pinky then first. I'd do the shift in the middle of those two notes. You see what I'm doing there? So my pinky's already out there, so I might as well grab it and then move my first finger up, get that note, and then finish that, finish off there. Okay. So uh, that would be uh, uh, five three and then six five three. And if you want to go to a root, there's another F there. Okay. So that's not bad to know. I didn't put it up there. I would, I did. I had it up there and I deleted it because I didn't want you to think I was showing you a three per scale. That's not what we're working on. Uh, I wanted to show you the major diatonic that vertically fits right in that. Is that vertical or horizontal on the guitar? I don't know. Vertically, I, I would say vertically fits right over that shape, okay? If I were to go down here, then I would be kind of going down. And that would be a, a way that you would transition down to the, the shape that is before the D shape, which is the E shape. And okay, there's the E shape F chord, okay? It looks like an E chord. So it's an E shape, but technically it's an F chord. Exactly, John. John, you're, yeah. So when you when you center on that root note, you kind of just hit it every now and then. You know, I mean, it's one thing if you're going to do exercises, you can do the exercise. But you still should, could take that exercise and end on a root note um, just so that, again, you realize, okay, I'm in the key of F or I'm in the key of whatever this note is. Um, and, and that way it'll, it'll help you kind of find it later when you're looking for it. Okay. All right. So uh, now, like I said, I, I, uh, oh, we're going to do, okay, well, let's do the finger fingerings. And again, this is going to be optional how you do it, but I'm going to okay, figure it this way. We're going to start the third fret. We're going to go one, three, four, then one, three. Then we're going to shift down and go one, two, four, one, two, four. And we're going to shift back up a fret and go one, three, four, one, three, four. There's a lot of redundancy here. That little snippet there. See how I finished it off to land on the root? That that feels real good in the hands, no matter where you are in the room. And there's the other root. So if we're going to set it, uh, 
We got that other root right there, which is nice. Okay. So again, let's go descending. We got uh, at, at the third fret, we're going to go four, three, one, four, three, one, four, two. No, shift down, four, two, one, four, two, one. And then here you can go four, one, or three, one, or four, two. You know, you could go four, three. You could go uh, four and then nose. <laughs> I didn't touch my nose. The guitar touched my nose. Guitar cannot transmit COVID. Actually, <laughs> the opposite of that is true. <laughs> I guarantee when I was at the NAM show, I, I'm sure people got COVID after the NAM show in 2020. That was in January. And the first cases actually predate the NAM show in California. Uh, uh, and not only the first case, the first death predates. So that means that whoever had that had it for, for probably a couple weeks beforehand. Um, and they exhumed her body up in the Bay Area because they had, they suspected COVID. So they and they determined it was COVID. Um, but the um, uh, uh, yeah, picking up guitars at the Nam show and I guarantee you. Um, and and not to mention half of the you know not half but oh I, probably a sixth of the exhibitors were from China. Uh, so they're the Nam shows. The LA NAMM show, I think, is a big NAMM show for Asia. I think a lot of Asia comes to, I think there's probably one somewhere in Asia. I don't know. There's one in Nashville in the summer now, and then there's the um, Music Mesa. Has anybody ever been to, I've never been to Music Mesa, but it's funny because everybody's smoking there. It's like anyone I know that's gone to Music Mesa, they can't believe that it exists because it's almost like going to the NAMM show in the 70s. <laughs> I mean, I went to the NAMM show. I remember Go-Go Girls <laughs> and the booze all had girls in bikinis and stuff like that. Uh, everyone was smoking. Everybody's drinking a beer. It was like a totally different thing than what's going on now. Um, oh, my gosh, John, that's a drag. Sheesh. Yeah, this, uh, in fact, I just... Um, there's all sorts of uh, side effects that are just weird. Some people have completely different side effects and long lasting things, you know, the, the brain fog and stuff like that. Dementia, brain dementia is another one. This, a, a friend of mine, she's gotten, been getting 500 texts, of, random texts a day from this lady that has COVID brain dementia. So, but, well, hopefully, John, hopefully it'll start to fade away. I mean, it, it may have affected other things too. So, you know, you, I'm sure you're being checked out. So, okay. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, we're okay. So now let's. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna. We're gonna do the scale again. We're gonna do this major tonic again. But we've already done twice, and I don't expect you to have it nailed. Don't worry. Uh, but we're gonna do it this way. Now we're gonna do it with the letter names of the notes. Okay. So I'm gonna. So I don't expect you to know those, but I want you to learn them. I want you to learn every note on the fretboard. That's ultimately, yeah, yeah, you lost a sense of smell. Yeah. Well, John, I'll be praying for you. Uh, the um, So John, uh, God knows. So that's the cool thing about God. God knows everything. So I just, I just said, John Bratt. I'm going to pray for John Bratt, and uh, hopefully the fog will be lifted. Uh, that would be great if you could have your brain back. Uh, but this is fun. Guitar is good. Guitar playing is good for that. So, yeah. Yeah, BYOG to the NAM show from now on. Uh, yeah, they're going to have it this year. I don't know if I'm going to go or not. I mean, I'm invited every year. I, I mean, I'm not afraid to go. I just, I, actually, I am afraid to go, but not because of COVID. I'm just afraid to go because it's, it's just, it's the parking and the driving and the, oh my gosh. But, um, okay, so we're going to, um, I'm going to give you the letter names of the notes, ready? Try to talk about something more pleasant, sorry. Not that I, not that I don't feel for you, um, at all, that's not at all true. Okay, so we're going to go G, A, B flat. 
So the key of F has a B flat in it, and that's it. That's everything else is just the regular alphabet letters. Okay, we have a B flat, and then C, D, and then the shift. Sandy, God bless you. What? What? What kind of currency is that, <laughs> Sandy Gamer? I've never, yeah, I've never even seen you comment, but thank you. Okay, uh, let me do this again. Sorry. Um, G, A. B flat, C, D, okay, E, and now we have our first F, the first root, F, G, A, B flat, C, shift up again to this third fret, D, E, F, G, A, B flat, backwards, B flat, A, G, you should know that as a G, right? And then you might know this is a D. F, E, D. You should know that as a D. We're going to shift down, put our pinky on the C note. B flat, A. Glad you're here, Leo. <laughs> then, uh, sorry, G, F, E. And then we're going to go down to D. C, however you want to do that, and then down again to B flat, A, I'm sorry, yeah, A, G, and if we want, we go to the next, the pentatonic before, <laughs> I mean, the, the caged method chord before, and totally ruin this lesson. <laughs> so, well, wait, what are we doing? So, so this is the, this is the form, the shape that you want to see. Uh, last week we did, we did the, on Tuesday, actually, remember, we because I had that wedding on, on Monday. We had the E form. We took the E form up, and lo and behold, there it is. Okay, and uh, so we we built the pentatonic scale and the diatonic scale around the E form. And then the week before that, if we did E last week, then the week before that we did G. I'm going backwards in the cage method. So I'm spelling dagak. <laughs> okay, so we're playing. This is the G shape. If I move it up two frets, that's each shape. You don't need to be able to play this, but visualize that. And by visualizing that, you've got 50% of the pentatonic scale, which was our number one pentatonic, our favorite pentatonic scale. And then we had diatonic scales built in there. And just, I gave you a couple different ways you could uh, finger it. That's crazy, Joseph. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's that one, and that's the G. And then we, we go back another shape, and we get the A shape, right? And I, in this scenario, in this lesson, that was three, four weeks ago, I used... I went, we went to the key of C. I want to go to kind of fun key, you know, keys we're going to likely use. Um, and so we did C and came up and sure enough, if, and I didn't do, but if you want to have six note C chord, you could bar all five, six strings and get that. That would be the, the fifth on the bottom. that and so that when you learn that a form you've technically learned 50 percent of the notes you need for the major pentatonic there which it, again, i'm talking really fast here and i apologize but i'm just this is a quick review okay and then we go back and before a was c and there's our c shape moved up two frets to be a d chord um so technically all of these this scales are d scales and then i showed you the minor there too that's the b minor uh the relative minor so um a D major pentatonic is the same as a, a B minor pentatonic, same exact notes. Um, the only difference would be maybe you want to, if you're playing over D, you're going to want to land on some D notes. And if you're playing over the B minor, you're going to want to land on some B, B notes, okay? Uh, but scale-wise, note-wise, they're the same thing. Oops, sorry. I like how you guys kind of 
help each other and thank each other and pray for each other on this on the the, the chat there and think about you know I, I appreciate you guys all doing that 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 makes me happy. <laughs> Bruce, we should have approved that one comment. <laughs> it would have shown up as contrast. Uh, that's funny, Sam. Sam, I had to approve this. Remember to to hot, hot the like button. <laughs> It helps Tom's channel. I'm not sure if the word hot or the bu word button was the one that triggered me, <laughs> triggered the warning. <laughs> but yeah, it's funny. Okay, so again, we're today, the, the this is the seventh lesson we've done on the cage method. Okay. Um, and, and this one is the, the like I said, the, the D shape we're moving around the fretboard. Okay. Um, and one thing you can do is you can work again, pl uh, like playing the note, the root note. Like, remember, I said, you know, you're doing a you're gonna mess around on this, land on the root. You, the other thing you can do is try to maybe hit the chord, even if it's a little triad like this, or a little mini power chord like this, whatever. Uh, but that will help you also get grounded and, and to start to see it'll, the chord will help you find a lot of the notes in the scale. Like I said, the chord will help you find 50% of the notes in the pentatonic scale. In fact, the chord is actually three fifths of the pentatonic scale. All right. Uh, the, the, in this case, the F triad is F A C. Well, that's three of the five notes in the F major pentatonic F G A C D. See, I'm going to say it. F, A, C, there's your triad. Okay, I'm going to say F, G, A, C, D. Okay, so the, and then we go to F again. Now you've had, you, you've got the entire pentatonic scale, um, and three fifths of it are technically triad notes. Now, um, so if you hit the chord, that kind of gets you centered. Here's why, because then what I want you to do is maybe go to up two frets, now and play G, see if you can play the pentatonic scale for G major there. Um, but yeah, it's even though it's it's one of the least favorite pentatonic scales, it's definitely I I definitely sit there. I, I definitely will sit there when I'm playing live uh, or soloing or whatever. It's a great place to kind of because uh, because here's the, the other thing. If look at that major pentatonic. Okay, now I want you to look at the, so there's two notes per string, right? The pentatonic scales on the guitar tend to be two notes per string. Uh, is the chord, well, no, the chord is one, three, five, okay? Every triad is basically one, three, five. Super easy, John, if you have a piano around, you can just go with white keys and do every other white key, and you can just make triads to your heart content, Okay. Um, and so you play C, E, G, and then D, F, A, and those are going to be different types of triads. Like one's going to be major, one's going to be minor, and then you have another minor and major. And that would be cool if you could start to hear it and go, oh, I hear the difference between D minor and D major. Or, or I hear the I hear that D, the D minor, I hear it's a minor and the C, E, G is major. You know, that would be cool if you could start to hear that. But yes, one, three, five are the, um, uh, are the tones in a triad, major triad. Um, and then um, the only other tones we need to add to create the pentatonic are the two and the six, all right? And there's other types of pentatonic scales, and we've talked about them in the past, but, uh, but these are the ones where major and minor pentatonics are the ones we're talking about right now. So um, I got sidetracked. Uh, oh, uh, so, oh, yeah, I know what I was going to say. So, okay, remember, we're, we're in F, right? So if you see this, you can go, okay, I can, I, you know, that D shape, okay, I, I get that. I get it that that's an F, okay, okay, cool. Okay, well, look at the, remember we have two notes per string. Okay, so the bottom note, if we played the, the top note of each one of those, it would be this. Right? Five, 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 six, five. If we played the bottom note of each of those, it would be three, 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 two, three, three. Okay, look at what's happening on the, fifth, fourth, and third string. Okay, here, here, here. Oh, what? Wait. Oh, that's an E chord moved up a fret, which is an F chord. Oh, see that? So you can see, 
here's a triad, and you can see this triad too. So it's a, really when I'm kind of going. I might be visualizing this chord as much as I am this chord, or this cage shape as much as I'm visualizing this cage shape, okay? Does that make sense? Um, because they're all neighboring each other, okay? Okay, again, going back to here, they're all just like next door to each other. So, and they're always in the same order. They're always in the order of the word cage, no matter what you start on. If you look at the second diagram there, it starts on the A chord, goes to G, E, uh, C, or D, and then C. So it spells cage, but it starts on the A. But if we were to keep going from there, from that C up there, uh, that red C on the second diagram, way at the top there, 12th fret, the next one would be A. So you'd, you'd start to see that the word cage is going to be spelled again. So that's why the cage method is such a popular method, because it's easy to remember. It's really easy to remember. At the very least, uh, yes, exactly right, Gary. <clears throat> and the minor pentatonic would be one three, four, five, seven, but again, it's not, you'd be starting on a minor, and I don't want to, I don't want to just, I don't want to confuse things yet. Um, but yeah, so if we were, and the, and the major scale is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So the pentatonic is the major scale minus two, two tones. Like John uh, uh, in, in Louisville pointed out earlier, and he may be with a patient now, but he pointed out earlier, the two missing ones are the four and the seven. So in the in the major pentatonic, there's no four or seven. Doesn't mean you can't play them. Uh, so if I'm playing in the there's the four. I so essentially what I'm playing is diatonic scale, but I can also just play the pentatonic scale and just add that fourth too. So you could have a six note scale. Um, in fact, what would that sound like if we did it? cool um if we just added the seventh didn't add the fourth it would sound like this um let's see what would it be Is it minus two tones of pentatonic rapper? Yes. And minus two tones is a pentatonic rapper. John, I explained, because I'm stupid. <laughs> I explained co complicated music theory understandably. I, 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 tr I aspire to that. The other thing I tend to do, one of the best compliments I got a um, while back was just the way, because the way I'm, my thinking is I'm, uh, okay, everybody take a sip. I touched my face. I'm going to give myself COVID. Um, it is one of the best compliments I ever got um, was I, people, someone said, I don't teach how to play music. I teach how to make music. Um, and that's kind of what I do all day. I'm making music all day long. Um, I mean, sometimes I do, like I, yesterday I was doing a session for a, a cartoon on Netflix, uh, playing guitar on that. Played, I played guitar and I played my bass six on it. Uh, and so, um, and so I do a lot of session work. Um, but when I'm not doing session work, I'm writing, and I'm writing for TV or I'm writing for pop artists. And um, going to be doing some game scoring here in a little bit too. Uh, so that's going to be a new thing for me. But that's coming up, and I'll give you more information on that um, as it happens. But um, uh, uh, so, um, but yeah, so my goal is, is to teach you how to play music, but also the idea is, you know, like I said, like I'm always saying, oh, well, that's kind of like a horn section line or something, or, um, you know, that's, you know, that's a flat third, that's a cool lick, how did they come up with that, you know, with, with, What's the, what's the thinking behind that and how can you use it? You know, the, my goal is for you to be playing and making music and, and not competing with me, <laughs> but, 
but making your own music, uh, you know, and it, it doesn't, music doesn't have to be complicated. Some of the best songs, I, I, I my, some of my most popular videos are my songs with two chord videos, because the idea is, is just for encouragement to get beginner beginners to be able to play. If you can play two chords, you can play a song. Heck, you, there, I think Dylan has a couple songs that are just, you <laughs> you're just banging out E chords. Uh, there are definitely some songs that are just one chord, but they may be a riff or something. Uh, so, oh, thank you. Yeah, the, oh, the Discord link. You know what? I'm going to post it myself because it looks funny, Bruce. Your your Discord link looks funny. So I'm going to put... And the Discord is where you can go to get... All, oh, shoot. Speaking of. Sorry, Holly. I haven't posted these. Um, so I'm going to I'm gonna pin the Discord link. And I'm going to go to Discord right now. So if you go to if you join the Discord, you go to um, Tom's lesson PDFs and all that. You can you'll you can you have free access to every one of these. I'm going to upload today's here. Where is it? There it is. Uh, you have access, and Holly, God bless her, she's been turning them into a single PDF uh, so that you don't have to have you don't have to do it yourself. Okay, it's not hard to do it yourself, but. Okay, so these are today's. Oh, I'm going to have to put my guitar down. This doesn't count as changing guitars, by the way, so you can't take a sip. All right. Upload, 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 upload. Okay. So they're there, Holly, if you need them. Um, and I'm going to I'm gonna actually... Can I mute this? Where's the mute button? That's no, all right. I'll just close it. All right. So... Um, um, so, so you can go to the discord, um, join up, it's free, doesn't cost anything. Nobody's going to sell you anything. Um, a lot of times there's lots of great, uh, basically they, on the discord, they just talk about me when I'm not around. No, I'm kidding. It's other guitar stuff. People are showing off their guitars. Uh, Bruce is building me a sh cigar box guitar. So you can see the the process there um he's got a whole he's got a whole um uh what, what are they called dennis uh thread i guess it's those are individual threads the hashtag things are threads right i don't know the nom nomenclature for discord um, i'm not on discord very often so you won't necessarily find me there occasionally I, i'll log on especially if somebody's not showing up or if somebody's sick or something like that i'll log on and see how everybody's doing um well, and I don't teach songs because, uh, John, because uh, I don't, I feel bad. I mean, I don't feel bad for Rick Beato, but it's like, you ever watch a Rick Beato video and they got a million commercials? It's because he doesn't have any control over that. Because if he's doing someone else's song, they control it and he doesn't make any money on that. He makes money. I mean, he may get a percentage of it, but I get 100% of my YouTube revenue, which isn't a lot. Uh, but hey, it, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, it all adds up. Um, and, um, so, you know, I, I try to, um, um, keep my channel free of the copyrighted material. So I don't have to, now I do lesson songs. I will do lesson songs on songs I wrote. So like I recently done a couple lesson songs, I think three in, in the, le this year I did three different pop songs that came out that I played guitar on. So if anybody's looking for those, how to play them, it's funny because <laughs> the first, first one I did was, uh, that's yellow raincoat and Bieber, Justin Bieber and I wrote that song together. I, it was like two days after Christmas back in 2011, maybe? Was it 2011? Could it have been 10 years ago? No. No. I, no, maybe it was 2014. I, I, anyway, so I posted. So I noticed that there were a lot of people teaching how to play it. Of course, nobody had it right. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, you know, I should do a lesson on how to play Yellow Raincoat. It was funny because I kept getting these comments like, 
What do you mean you wrote Yellow Rico? You didn't write that. Justin Bieber wrote that. I'm like, no, no, I wrote it. You go, no, you, you're too old to write a song with Justin Bieber. And I said, well, that's true, but it happened anyway. Um, and it and still is happening, which is, God bless the kid. <laughs> I love that kid. Hey, actually, he's he's the same age as uh, my son, Jack. They're two weeks apart, my middle son, Jack. So, And he's met all my kids. He met my mom. He met my wife. He's, yeah. He's met my niece, um, and uh, so yeah. No, I, he actually is, he's he, he's st st hey. I would I would have been dead from drug overdose. I'm sure if I was that rich and famous when I was his age. So he's he's a miracle, a living miracle, <laughs> to be honest. A cigar box. <laughs> what did what did auto correct him? A oh, guitar box. Yeah, that's funny. A guitar. Hey, Bruce, maybe you should make a, 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 a cigar box out of a guitar box. <laughs> Somebody should do that. They should have a cigar box that's shaped like a guitar. <laughs> I guess you could have it, you know, shaped like a, a guitar and have, the, have them stacked vertically or something. That would be funny. Oh, you, oh you're getting an oud from, oh, awesome. Yeah, I, I'm getting. I'm kind of waiting around to hear. If, um, I'm getting a delivery today from FedEx of a new instrument, new Middle Eastern instrument. I'm not gonna say what it is. I'm gonna do another unboxing and review and everything. Uh, I actually, I doubt it's gonna come with new strings, but I will. See, I wonder if I can find. It's a weird instrument. Although I can give you a clue. There's a live video of, of uh, oh yeah, well that's, no, wow, that's expensive, I wouldn't buy the, oh there are loop ends, okay, well I guess that kind of makes sense. So it's not an old instrument, it was, the, this instrument was developed in 1930, so there's another clue. Um, uh, David Gilmore. There's a video of David Gilmore playing one of these live. So, so you might be able to guess it. Hey, Lena, just you just pop in and say hello. Ugh, you, have, you have more important things to do than hang out with me, <laughs> rambling at this point. Um, okay, so let me do a let me do a quick review of the caged method. Okay. We have new, but again, every time I hit this, you, every time I review this, um, uh, you you pick up something new along the way, or I say something differently that makes you understand it better, or understand it in the first for the first time. Uh, but the Cage method is a method named for the five chord shapes that are strewn throughout the fretboard. Um, and uh, there are five chord shapes you tend to learn very early in your guitar playing career. C major, A, G, E, and D. And what we did in the first lesson was I had you play it with these, all, those, because you'll notice every one of those chords has three notes or three fingers. And I had you play it with these two fingers. Now, this stuff I wrote here, boom, okay, is so you can move it up and down the fretboard. Okay, and um, I, can, I can explain this four-point thing. Uh, looks like there's an asterisk right before the one, doesn't it? It's not. That's a. That's not an asterisk. Or as I call it, butt magic. <laughs> asterisk, butt magic. Okay. Uh, so C, and then A, and G. You play it with these three fingers. Might not be, like I don't usually play A with these three fingers. The other ones feel normal. Uh, but then play it with these three fingers. So don't use your first finger. Do the exact same thing and play those three chords with these three fingers. And that's hard. Uh, but what it does is it frees up your first finger so that you can have your human capo. So now this was C. This is C sharp. This was A. This is A sharp or B flat. This is G. This is G sharp or A flat. This is E. Here's F. This is D. This is D sharp or E flat. Okay? So now you got a movable shape. And so technically when you substitute these three fingers and then you use your first finger as a capo that doesn't represent five chords that represents 60 chords which is really cool i love to simply multiply information or knowledge i love it when it's simple to multiply knowledge
So by simply playing the C chord with these three fingers and even not even playing necessarily being able to play this, but being able to visualize it. Because you can see this, you visualize this, because you played it a million times. So just try to visualize this up the fretboard and now you can see all the C shapes. And these are all C shapes, but they're different chords, 12 different chords. If I can if we go to there, that's 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then we get C again. So that would be redundant. Uh, but if I stop here, I got the scales associated with that shape. So the same thing's true with all these. Okay, so we did that, and then what I did was I took all of those shapes and I showed you how they're all connected. Uh, so they go in, always go in that order of the word caged, but they may not start on the C, they may start on the A, the G, the E, or the D, but they'll always go to that next letter. Um, so as you see the fretboard, like if you look at that first fretboard, there's the C, there's the A, there's the G, there's the E, and there's the D shape, and those are all C chords. If I were to play those notes, C, 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 those are all Cs, okay? And we do the same thing with the A. If I played this, there's the A. If I play this G shape, that's A. That's A, these are all A's, okay? Um, and then so on and so forth. And this was, so it, the idea is, the whole point of the cage method is to really reveal the fretboard and open it up and allow you to start to see how to play up and down the fretboard. And not just for soloing. I mean, I don't want you to think this is for soloing. No, it's actually great for finding, you know, might be, you know, really um, different voicings you can use than the standard. Oh, what was it? What did I go to? Uh, the five chord? You know, or the four chord. Um, but yeah, you can, um, you can find chord shapes all up and down the fretboard using the case method. And, and then uh, it's not just used for soloing. I'd say it's about a 50-50 thing, particularly for me. I mean, and I, you know, I always say... Guitar players spend, you know, 90% of their time practicing soloing um, and 10% of their time practicing rhythm. And then when they get to a gig, they spend 90% of their time play, playing rhythm and only 10% of the time soloing. So you're kind of overemphasizing sometimes your practice routine. Um, to be honest, the, the players that tend to get the most work are the ones that play are really good rhythm guitar players. Uh, especially in the studio, you know, if you're a really good rhythm player, you come up, you have great ideas for rhythm, and they may be soloistic rhythm ideas, uh, but you're more likely to get, you know, some of those guys that can shred and can play, oh man, they can crazy, you know, I think of Guthrie Govan. Uh, Guthrie Govan may get a lot of such work, I don't know, he just worked on the movie Dune, which is cool, because um, he tours with, if you don't know who Guthrie Govan is, uh, <laughs> he is <laughs> one of the most amazing guitar players I've ever seen. And he does clinics and stuff. But, you know, it's like people aren't necessarily calling him to play on records unless they're like, uh, pr you know, prog rock or something like that. But, um, you know, the guys that tend to get a lot of work, the kind of unknown, unnamed guys, the guys that just can lay down a solid groove, come up with a great feel, come up with a good idea, you know. And that's kind of what I – originally I wanted to be the world's greatest and fastest guitar soloist, you know. <laughs> But I just kept getting passed by everybody. So I decided, no, no, it's that's not as critical. But uh, Tim Pierce does great solos. But you know what? I bet you 99% of his, his uh, uh, although he does get hired to do a lot of rock records, so the solos. But, you know, most of his work is playing rhythm. Like most of the day he's playing rhythm. He may throw a solo down. Um, I may, you know, like I'll do a solo pass on a thing, and then they may or may not use it. Um, but I, it's more just like for kind of fun and for a break in the day. Uh, but if they, a lot of times, read all three books. Oh, what books are we talking about? Oh, does he have? Oh, Mondays always throw me because the trash trucks. I'm like, who's at my front door? It's not, it's the trash trucks. The trash truck is at my front door. Yeah, yes, Leo, the, the voices are also very, very helpful for songwriting, too. That's exactly right. Um, 
But Tim Pierce is a great rhythm player. He comes up with great parts, you know, and that's why he gets most of his work. I mean, like I said, I, name name me the last time you heard a guitar solo in a pop song. I'll tell you who's who's touring. Uh, who's the guitar player from? Who's the more than words guitar player? Great guitar player, right? Um, dang it. Really good soloist. I mean, you know, really good, fat, flashy soloist, I should say. Yep. Yep. I didn't, I didn't really, uh, yeah, Dwayne Allman was part of the, probably the part of the, um, uh, the Southern, what was the, what was the name of that studio down in Memphis, or uh, not Memphis, in, uh, Mississippi. Um. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Guthrie Govan tours with Hans Zimmer. I and I know uh, uh, Tina Guo, who's his cellist. Uh, Tina and I are friends. I, I know Guthrie, but he wouldn't recognize me at a party. Tina would. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, they, they redid Dune, so, and and uh, Hans Zimmer did the score for it. Uh, yeah, Frank Herbert wrote... I, I, he was the original composer for Dune? No, I don't know. N uh, Nuno Bentoncourt, yeah. Nuno Bentoncourt is the guitar player. Thank you, Holly. Um, Nuno is touring with, and has been for a while, touring with, of course, nobody's touring, uh, with Rihanna of all people, and she uses him to like play big solos and stuff like that. Uh, it's kind of cool. So if you go, if you YouTube Nuno Bentcourt and Rihanna, you can see some live footage. I don't know if they if they do more than words. That would be really cool if they did more than words. I, now that let me see if that exists because uh, that was a smash. And I I tell you, I taught that so many so many people want to learn, and that one song. Created an entire style of pop music. Um, Rihanna, more than no. words. Yeah, I don't think so. Oh, more than words. New Bank resume. Please. Oh, with Rihanna band singer. Am I? Oh my gosh. New Bank live in Paris with Rihanna. Wow, he's been with her for a while. Nine years. Huh. I think that's so awesome. Because, you know, I always, I always get bummed about, like, pseudo one-hit wonders. I mean, what was the name of the band, you know, Ben Court's band? Extreme. Was that the name of the band, Extreme? I don't remember. Isn't that funny? That doesn't sound familiar. Yes, Sting played in the original Dune movie. Yeah, and it did, it did horribly. That was a financial fiasco. Yes, thank you, John. Um, Extreme. Yeah, I don't remember the band being called. I remember Nuno. He's, I'm, a, I'm kind of assuming he was Extreme because he sing, he sang, played the guitar, and and wrote. So that's that's he, you know, he made all the money in that band. Muscle Shoals, thank you, Gary. Uh, yeah, so I knew Glenn Campbell was a member of the Wrecking Crew. Um, uh, I I aspired to do the one of the reasons I moved out here was to be part of that group of musicians. Of course, it didn't happen, and they don't really exist anymore. I do session work in L.A., but it doesn't work. It's not the same thing as it was back then. You know, um, there's some. If you haven't seen the movie The Wrecking Crew, uh, I think you can see it on YouTube for free. Um, and it's, it's, it's Danny Tedesco's first and I think only movie. Uh, he was the documentary filmmaker and it was his father. It started with him, him kind of inter interviewing his father. And I don't know if it was because his father was dying of cancer or he was just, you know, curious, but father had all these great stories. And so basically started interviewing others and they, you know, and he created this documentary that had, I think, 125 songs in it. So he couldn't release it for uh, forever because he couldn't get the rights to use all these songs. And um, 
And I kid you not, if you're my age, you know every single one of those songs. And you're like, wait, that's them? That's them? That You know, Sonny and Cher, Frank Sinatra, Pink Panther movie, Beach Boys, like a lot of Beach Boys stuff. Um, Nancy Sinatra, these boots that were made for walking. Um, there were, the drummer, Hal Blaine for the Wrecking Crew, played on seven records of the year in a row. Uh, I think the last one was Love Will Keep Us Together by Captain Neil. In fact, I think he was their touring drummer. And that, and, and it was interesting because it kind of, kind of fell apart in the '80s when new wave music came in, and and bands were doing a lot of their own playing. A Toto was an example of that. You know, every Toto musician, they were all session guys, and they formed a band because they kind of kind of see and decided to do that thing. I think it was partially because they could kind of see the writing on the wall that the '80s was going to be drum machines and new wave and synthesizers and. Um, uh, and bands generally doing all their own playing, like the Police, you know, Duran Duran, uh, groups like that doing a lot of their own playing. And a lot of music was being made. A lot of the hits were being made in England instead of in L.A. And so, and then there were a lot of people, you know, in the early '90s that moved to Nashville from L.A. So, and there it's happening again right now. Um, we, I have someone almost ask me every week to move to Nashville. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, let's see. Funk Brothers, yeah, that one's good too. Uh, that one, I I like the rec. I, I love the Funk Brothers music and everything. The way the Wrecking Crew video was done was just interviews and stuff. I like that better because the Funk Brothers. What the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Gary, the Funk Brothers movie did um, um, like they they talk a little bit and then they would show them jamming in the studio. And then it would go to, you know, and I don't want to see them jamming today, reminiscing about the, that makes me sad. Uh, there was another video like that. And I was like at the, but at least they put the jam at the end. Um, it might've been, it was the Sound City one. There's a, there's a, there's a video, there's a movie, uh, a documentary made by Dave Grohl. Who, uh, Cause Sound City is where they, in, in Van Nuys is where they um, recorded Nirvana, a bunch of famous records, uh, Fleetwood Mac. In fact, the the modern Fleetwood Mac was formed at that studio because Mick Fleetwood came in to check out Sound City when it was a brand new studio and said, "Hey, uh, I want you know, can you play me something that was recorded here?" And the only thing that had been recorded there was the Knicks, the uh, Buckingham Knicks record. And Stevie and and Lindsay were in like the green room, like sleeping or something. They were like living at the studio. They had no money, and uh, Mick Fleetwood heard the tracks and Lindsay's sitting in there going, why is it? So who's playing our music? They could hear their music being played. It's a great story. And, and, uh, Mick Fleetwood said, who's the guitar player? And the owner said, Oh, that's, that's Lindsay Buckingham. This is his record. And Mick offered him a job and, and Lindsay said, no, not unless you take Stevie too. Now they were dating at the time. And, uh, they were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time, and uh, so he, Mick had to take Stevie. Well, it was the best thing they ever did, because I don't know that Fleetwood Mac with with uh, Lindsey Buckingham would have been as big, would have been anywhere nearly as close as big as Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks joining Fleetwood Mac. But that's another one that's kind of like it. But at the end, I think there was like a jam session or something like that, and I mean it's fine, but I I, I don't know. It's it's. I think Paul McCartney was part of the jam session at the end of that one. I think maybe. Uh, so I probably watched that one, but some of those are, are kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, Precaro is one of the greatest. Um, I wish I'd worked with him. Um, I have a lot of friends that worked with him. My friend, my friend CJ Vanston's produced, I think the last three Toto records and CJ is who I go to. Uh, he takes me with him to Louisville to play for the Muhammad Ali thing. Um, but, uh, Oh, was it Stevie that got Lindsay kicked out? Yeah, I, I was like, fortunately, I got to see them in that iteration. Alex took me for my birthday to see a Fleetwood Mac, the, those five. It was those five, which is great. Uh, but um, boom. Do you drink out of a baseball bat? Or Orville's asking me, what? <laughs> Do I drink out of a baseball bat? Let's see.
Um, and I've subbed for Lukather. I've met Steve Lukather from Toto. Uh, I think, is he the only Toto member that I've met? Or, I mean, original Toto? Um, my friend CJ also is is uh, <laughs> is uh, amp music director for Spinal Tap. He's done that for 25 years. <laughs> Talk about a fun gig. Or probably has done it for 30 years. Um, Pete Thorne. Oh, yeah, Carol Kay. Yeah, she taught lessons a lot. Yeah, Pete Thorne. Um, you know, the, the guy that everybody took lessons from in L.A. that I never did and I wish I had, and he passed away a few years ago, was um, Ted Green. Um, and he he taught lessons for $15 a half hour, like, just as recently as, like, 15 years ago. It was, like, crazy. It was, like, what? So, yeah, everybody, all the, all the guitar players in L.A. except me took guitar lessons from Ted Green at some point. I took, I studied with Carl Verheyen. Um, and, uh, studied, but I, you know, I took maybe five or six lessons from him. So not a lot. I couldn't afford it. Um, I just, you know, I remember the last time I took a lesson from him, I had brought my wife and, uh, cause I wanted to show her <laughs> cause he lived in a nice house. And I said, here's what I can, <laughs> here's what I might be able to do, baby <laughs> someday. And it happened, but you know, it took forever. I think she was expecting it a little sooner, but I know I was. She never, she never made me feel bad about it, but, um, so I, I took her to the, this lesson. It was the last one I did just because, I mean, it was just, again, money was tight and, um, uh, she, she could look, hear the lesson as it was going on. She goes, I think you showed him as much as he showed you. And I, I was like, I doubt that. But from her perspective, she thought it seemed, sounded like I was like, oh yeah, I, I know she did this or the whatever. And, um, but Carl, Carl was Carl was really good at opening my eyes about a lot of things, uh, about session work. So that was why I was taking lessons from him. Uh, the thing he said that was interesting to me was that he goes, Tom, I'm really glad you're like the only student that takes lessons from me that doesn't ask me for gigs. And because and, I wanted to pretend to be or pretend to be a peer, you know, and if I asked him for gigs, that would put me in a lower. I was I was trying to be like him. And so, you know, I didn't want to ask him for a gig. I just felt like if I played good and he liked my attitude or whatever, that he might recommend me for stuff. And he did a couple things, not a lot. So, uh, yeah, the Muscle Shoals video is really good, too. Really surprising that a bunch of redneck white guys played on all those classic, classic records, like Aretha Franklin and stuff, you know. Um, and just the greatest feel something in the water down there is kind of what they imply in the, in the video, but the, there's a, the muscle strolls video you can check out is really good. I thought it was good. The, the only downside to that one, I think there was, they spent a lot of time kind of talking about, and same thing with the sound city one. It was kind of like talking about regrets or infighting and things like that. And I mean, maybe that plays a role in it. Uh, it makes the documentary a little bit more dramatic which I understand as a documentary filmmaker, the, you know, that's part of your job is to create drama, but yeah. Um, yes. Peter Green named, that's right. P Peter Green, uh, uh, Peter Green. I, yeah, I didn't know Peter Green named the band. I feel bad. Peter Green went, was it drugs, John, that fried his brain? I'm, I'm assuming so. It was the sixties. Um, I had to, years ago, I had to, tr I mean, really long time ago, like probably 30 years ago, I transcribed Albatross for some software company, which was really weird. So I, I did, I tried to transcribe it note for note um, for some software company. And I don't know whatever happened to that. I got paid for it, but I mean, it was, it was hard because I didn't want to make a mistake. I wanted to get it exact and it was not in the, that's, you know, if, if you're going to, put something to print um, and print a bunch of books, uh, tab books. And I, I've, I mean, the tab websites are awful. Those websites are awful. You know, they're always wrong. The tab books, if they go as far as uh, putting a, a, you know, like Eric Johnson, I bought those, you know, that tab book. If they go as far as that, they're probably checking with Eric Johnson to make sure they got it right or something. I don't know how they get it so close, but. Yeah, drug, all drugs. <laughs> What's your brain? Uh, probably aspirin is probably not great. Well, no, aspirin's probably pretty good. Oh, 
That's right. Yeah. Bob Marley recorded that too. Yeah. I mean, Respect, I think, was from the uh, When a Man Loves a Woman, the original recording was recorded there. You know, it's just like so many careers were made at that studio. It's just unbelievable. And that was basically one or two studios, the Muscle Shoals Sound. Um, I mean, the Rolling Stones went down there to record, right? Uh, Mike Campbell. Uh, Mike Campbell, was he a session guy too? I don't remember that, but he definitely... Oh, have, have I worked with any of the Steely Dan session guitarists? Um, yes, I did a... Let's see, I did two sessions in the early 90s with Dean Parks. Um, uh, he was amazing. Um, I So, and I remember I was... So it was a great, a friend of mine was my best, literally one of my best friends. He was the composer and he brought me in on this TV series for ABC called American Detective or True Detective or something. And every episode was in a different city. So every episode had a different vibe, you know, like one we did kind of a ZZ Top thing and that kind of, you know, Texas and, um, uh, and so they, uh, I was second guitar player for every session, but the first chair w was rotating. So Dean did two of them. Grant Geisman did a couple of them. Michael Thompson did a couple. Uh, uh, John Goo did one, who I don't see much anymore. Um, but Dean was funny because it, somebody, they brought in his rig, and back then they had these giant refrigerator rigs, right? These giant racks, sometimes two of them, full of effects and all sorts of stuff and pedal boards and amps and all sorts of crazy stuff. And I, I had my little setup. I had my little mini rig and all I could afford. And um, the, the, the cartridge guy, and cartridge guys are the guys that, uh, the, so these guitar players, they have a thousand guitars and thousand, all these racks up. They don't bring them themselves. They hire someone, they, someone pays them. So the cartridge guy actually made more than I did on the gig, but they bring, they have a truck, they load the truck up at the warehouse. They fill it full of Dean's stuff. Dean will tell them, you know, maybe, uh, well, back then it was a phone call. Hey, bring this and this and this and this and this. Okay. Um, or bring rig A or whatever. And they'll bring rig A. And so they bring it. They set it up. They leave. D Dean does a session. In the meantime, they're setting up rig B over in Studio 2, you know, for a different thing. And then Dean finishes the session. He leaves. They come pick that stuff up. They take it back to the warehouse or take it to the next session, things like that. I've never had cartage. I've never been busy enough or had enough gear to have to do that. Um, so Dean Dean did that. Well, the guy, the cartage guy, plugged the wrong cable into something and fried his entire rig right before the session that I was doing with Dean. So his amp did nothing worked. So he had his guitars, um, electric guitars, so he, all he had was they had a Mesa Boogie. So they gave him a Mesa Boogie. He had it in the room with him. I was in the other room, and I had my own room. And he has Mesa Boogie and a, his guitars, and he borrowed my slide. He still has the slide I gave him. I saw him recently. I said, you still have that slide? I have not been able to find one like it. And he said, yeah, do you want it back? I go, no, no, you can keep it. Goes, yeah, it, had some, it's, it still has the... There was like a piece of gel, like lighting gel in it. And he goes, it's still in there. I said, you're kidding. It's been 30 years. But he he uh, but he but sounded freaking amazing. And his reading chops were like, he didn't miss a note. I still have I still have the charts from those sessions. Um, I kept them just because I thought, oh, I'll practice reading or something like that. Uh, somewhere I have them. Yeah, but um, yeah, so, so Dean I've worked with. John Harrington, who tours with Steely Dan, um, I actually met when I was 15, and he jammed with me in my bedroom in Indianapolis because he was dating a friend of my sister's, and he, they came over for dinner or for Thanksgiving or something like that. And he kind of came up to my room. No, it was it, I would have been 18. Oh, no, 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 no. See, what year did the Pat Metheny Group record come out? 77? So I would have been 16. So he had the Pat Metheny group record. He thought he was going to come over again. He gave me the record that Pat Metheny gave him. Pat Metheny gave him this his copy of the Pat Metheny group record. 
<clears throat> and he gave it to me. And he said, oh, you just borrow this. Check this guy out. You won't believe Pat Metheny. He's amazing. And uh, so I told him to check it out. But I, so John Harrington jammed with me in my bedroom, and he was, he was pretty impressed. Uh, you know, I was kind of, for a 16-year-old kid to be into jazz uh, and into a lot of the guitar players he was into, he was pretty impressed. And I, Steely Dan, he was into, you know, we didn't really talk about Steely Dan. I don't remember that. But I was really into Steely Dan, and he ends, he's been Steely Dan's guitar player for 20 years now. Um, and that's John Harrington. Um, I actually recommended John for a gig in New York. I got called to do a sideline gig in New York, and I'm like, I live in L.A. And they go, yeah, well, what's it pay? I said, that's not enough for me to fly to New York. So, uh, oh, you're kidding. So John said someone spiked Peter Green's drink. Well, you can see that. <laughs> I'm reading it to you. Uh, Yeah, and then the, the electrotherapy probably did much worse. Yeah, oh, poor guy. He just passed away, too, didn't he? Um, let's see. Merle Brigante? Never, from San Pedro? No, I've not heard of him. Merle Brigante. Is he a session guitar player? Oh, he's a drummer. I, no, I don't. Um, why does old age bring on constipation <laughs> of the mind or body or both? Um, certainly doesn't bring on constipation of the mouth. <laughs> it's funny. You get an old white guy and an old black guy sitting on a porch together, pretty much agree on everything. <laughs> Let's see, uh, P Sam Peter Green, so one of my, oh, Peter Green, yeah. No, he had a, it's a, a sound that was um, Greenbaum. Oh, yeah, he, that's right, he died just last year. Um, may he rest in peace. Joseph, you, my doctor, told me we don't drink enough water. Yes, Bruce, I started drinking a lot more water. I should be drinking water instead of coffee, but I'll, I'll go to water from, as soon as I'm done with this. I'm trying to drink a lot more water, and you're right, that does help with constipation. Um, Beth goes through a lot of water. My daughter, Emma, drinks a lot of water. Most of the singers I know drink a lot of water because they got to keep their vocal. Um, oh, I'll have to check that out. Uh, PBS did a great show on Peter Green. Oh, so I told you earlier I was going to tell you, uh, uh, I'm sure we're losing people here. I'm just chit chat. Well, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> I guess I'm entertaining you. I don't know. Um, but yeah, as far as the Steely Dan people, um, have I worked with any of the mu other musicians on those records? It's 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 hard. It's funny because um, I looked a lot like if you look at the back of Katie Lied, there's a picture of Jeff Percaro uh, on the back of Katie Lied, the Steely Dan record, and that's pretty much what I looked like in like college. <laughs> it looks exact. Somebody thought I was once a, when I moved first moved out here. Somebody thought I was uh, um, Jeff Percaro and and. Uh, uh, Louis Conte, who's a great percussionist, um, tours with everybody. Um, he told me a great, I to, I've told the story about, um, uh, Jeff Percaro and Bruce Springsteen before, but did I, I've told, did I, I don't know. See, Diana's not here to tell me what stories I've told or not, but, um, I, there was a, I was mentioning about playing complete songs at like parties. You know, if I'm getting paid to play, you know, I'm going to have music out and I'm going to play. If you want jazz standards, I would play jazz standards. If you want a classical guitar, I'd play classical. If you want Christmas tunes, I would play Christmas tunes. I don't do that anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it helped, it paid some bills, especially around Christmas time. And um, so I, I was, at the time I was going to church in uh, Pasadena, Lake Avenue Church on Lake Avenue. That's why it's called Lake Avenue Church. And I, um, I get a, my phone rings. I answer the phone. I said, it was, Hey Tom, this is Earl Hershiser. I want to know if you, you would be willing to play at my house for, for my Christmas party. And I said, sure, Earl. Yeah, sure. I'll play at your house for Christmas. And this was like 92. This would have been Christmas 92. And Earl had the, probably the best year any pitchers ever had. What was it? 88. They won the world series. He won the MVP, he, like, pitched more shutouts. He had, he went, he broke the record for most innings without a hit, or without a, 
run. Um, <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> water. Never drink it. That's worth. <laughs> I had to. I had to prove that. So, <laughs> Orville. Um, <laughs> so, I thought it was one of my friends, you know, messing with me. So I hung up the phone, <laughs> and I went, "Oh, you know, I'm like Scott." Or Eric, or, you know, I'm like, I'm thinking one of my buddies, you know, that was messing with me. And the phone rings again, and I pick it up and go, hello? Go, Hi, Tom, this really is Oral Hershiser. <laughs> he knew, he could tell by the tone of my voice that I didn't believe him. And I went, oh, shoot, I'm so sorry. He goes, no, 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 I get it all the time. I said, yeah, that's got to be weird. I never thought about it. But, yeah, he probably is like, you know, <laughs> I don't know, name name a celebrity. You know, hey, my name yeah, is Tom Cruise, and I was just wondering. Yeah, sure, this is Tom Cruise. <laughs> it's like, well, now I have your phone number, Tom Cruise. Uh, that's why you have assistants. <laughs> that's right. So you don't have to make those phone calls. Um, but anyway, so I go over to Oral's house, and I, I set up. I go in the afternoon to set it up my rig, and I have Alex with him because Beth is working. And Alex was six months old at the time. And he was being a little fussy while I was trying to set up my PA system and the guitar stuff and get my classical guitar, everything, music stand and all that stuff. I brought all that stuff and I wanted to have it set up there beforehand so I could just show up and play and not be dragging stuff in during a party. And so Alex was being fussy and Oral was there and said, hey, well, maybe if I pick him up. So he, he picked up Alex and he was, you know, doing the whole pat on the back, you know, Oral was it. And Alex threw up on Oral Hershiser. <laughs> And uh, it was like, I said, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. And he goes, you're kidding. You know, he's got three or four kids of his own. So he goes, no, this is, no he, it wasn't what he was going to wear that night, thankfully. Um, and uh, so I went back and did the party, and it was great. And I sat there, and they fed me. And, you know, of course, because he goes to my church, half of the people there already knew anyway. So it wasn't like it was like I didn't feel like a hired hand, you know. And um, so uh, – the guys, a lot of the guys were hanging out in Oral's office, which was actually not much bigger than this room, a pretty small room. And it was wood paneled and it had a, a, a shelf around the, the entire perimeter of the thing. And every on the shelf was a, a framed magazine cover that he was on. And he was on so many, you know, Sports Illustrated and all these different magazines. Um, and he was also on the cover of Two Boys Life when he was a boy. And he was a star pitcher when he was a little boy. He was on the cover of Boy's Life twice. It's pretty amazing when you, you know, think about it. And then there was like the Golden Globe, uh, the Golden Globe, the Golden Gloves trophy was there. The, there was a copy of the World Series trophy there. I mean, it was, it was literally Mecca for sports fans. Cause he, you know, that's 88, 89 year was like the best year any pitcher had ever had. And of course, there were a lot of Dodger fans. It was last time I think they won. Oh, no, no, they won. No, they just won. What am I thinking? They won last year. But they hadn't won in a while. So, hey, Jeff Hook, what's going on? Yeah, I'm just shooting the breeze now. So, we yeah, we talked about, we did the new, there's the new one. Um, you know, I never did write, like, D-form or whatever. I should I never did do that. But I, but Holly's doing that. God bless her. She's doing, um, oh, Roy Buchanan is a great guitar player. Yeah, a great telly guy. Yeah, he's definitely an underappreciated guy. I got into session, guys. Once I decided I want to move to L.A., I was listening to everything Larry Carlton did, everything Lee Rittenauer did, everything Jay Graydon did, and everything, um, especially once I decided on that I was moving to L.A., not New York. Because for about a minute, I was thinking, is it New York or L.A.? And I realized if I was poor and couldn't afford the heat bill, that would be okay in Los Angeles. So I, when I was, as soon as I turned 21, the month after I turned 21, I flew to LA to check it out for 10 days and fell in love with it. I mean, I was, so a kid from Indiana going to LA, you're just going to be like, you know, the palm trees. Uh, it was, you know, the guitar stores. Um, the, the, I went to a different club every night to see different guitar players that, you know, I went to the baked potato cl clubs that I'd read about in guitar player magazine. Um, so it was, it was definitely a done deal when I came out here. And then it, six months later, I was living here. Uh, it took me a long time to get the courage to do it. But uh, boom, boom. Macro greens helps with <laughs> good. 
we get some medical advice here. You gotta be careful. <laughs> gotta get a disclaimer from YouTube. It's all good. Uh, that's kind of what I, I love how you guys help each other out. You all, you're all like, you know, loving on each other essentially. Um, and that's kind of, it's exactly what happens in discord. If you're going to join a discord, don't be discord, discordant, <laughs> be, t be cool, you know, and everybody's cool. And, uh, and if you're not cool on here, you're going to get booted off the live stream off the live chat. But, um, okay. So Monday, next Monday, what am I going to do? Uh, <sighs> Maybe what I will do is I will do all five shapes again and show you the blues or the the blues and the minor pentatonic over that. It may be a lot of diagrams on my part, but I don't know that I want to spend a week on each one of these because to me that's might be too much. But I mean that would be great because it could be five weeks of content. But I just don't I don't know that I could talk on each one of them for an hour. Oh, Sam has got, yeah, look at that. What a year. And all of those, many of those awards were in, this was 19, December 1992, I was at his house. He had a house oh, kind of overlooking the Rose Bowl. I mean, obviously not there anymore. Oh, you've lived in Southern California your entire 61 years. Well, I'm, I'm 60, so I'm right behind you, John. Um, got out of Pilates early. John Jeff Hook's doing Pilates. I didn't. I, I would never have. I would have never imagined that. But now I am. Mm. Gary, I am. Uh, well, New York and the New York scene was more of a jazz scene. And by the time I moved here, um, okay, here's one thing that when I came visited here in nine, uh, eighty two. Literally in August of 82, when I, right after I turned 21, I went to a club called At My Place in Santa Monica. It doesn't exist anymore. Or it, it, probably something else. I don't know. But it, but it was called At My Place. Um, uh, John Bratt, you might know. You might know that. You might remember At My Place. I'm trying to think. I don't think I ever played there. But I, I was looking for music to find, and so there was a sax player I never heard of. But I thought, okay, well, you know, it'll be cool. It was, you know, it was you know, prog kind of progressive jazz, or not even jazz. It was, you know, like impressive smooth jazz ish kind of stuff. There was a guitar player there. It was like blowing me away, and they did one of his songs, and I was like, oh my gosh! And that was that was Carl Verheyen. And so I went after the set. I went backstage and said, hey man, can I take a lesson from you? And so that week I took a lesson from him. I think it was a couple of days later while I was in California. And at the time he was living in an apartment in Van Nuys and I went to his apartment and I was a, a complete, in, in 1982, I was a complete jazz snob, right? And I was getting ready to move to LA and I was jazz snob and thinking, oh, you know, everything else sucks, you know? And um, so I, uh, go to Carl's house and he's got the police synchronicity album sitting on his desk. And I'm like, why are you listen to that? You know, that's pop. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm, I was literally, I was literally an idiot. Right. But I'm going, I, I, you know, police, what? It's like pop music. What are you listening to pop music for? And he said, and these, this is, this opened my eyes big time. He said, do you know how much I get paid to sound like Andy Summers? I said, wait, what? Because do you know how many people want Andy Summers on their record? Can't afford him. So they hire me to sound like him playing on their record. Now, they don't say Andy Summers played on our record, but that's true. In the 80s, that was one of the three or four sounds that everybody had to have nailed to work in town. I don't care if it was a record or a movie or a TV show. They wanted that police sound in the early 80s. And so I was like, I came back to Indiana, at, you know, flew back home. And first thing I did was I started getting into pop music. I started listening to pop radio. I started, started listening to new wave music. My little sister, I started asking my little sister for music advice. I wouldn't listen to anything she listened to prior to that. It was like, oh, you okay. And she had, she still to this day has great taste in music. I mean, she was listening to XTC. I was like, oh, no. And the police and all this. And I'm like, Duran Duran. And I'm like, no. And, and, and then I was like, oh, oh, wait a minute. 
oh, there's something going on here. And that's when I started kind of understanding that if I really want to work, jazz isn't going to be the jazz isn't going to be the way to feed myself. So New York is definitely not the way to go for me and L.A., you know, so. So that's yeah, that's kind of. Um, And then Gary tried to make Pilates. Yeah, Gary, you know, it's like I, if I did Pilates, I kind of know what would happen. Uh, the first time I tried to skate on ice at an ice arena, and Gary, you probably know how to skate back, you know, since you were born. But I got tangled. They had to cut me out of the hockey net. It was up. The hockey net was up against the wall, and I was circumnavigating, you know, when I was a kid. I was literally grabbing onto the rail around the the ice rink and, and I got in, I was trying to get around the net and I got caught in the net. My two, and the thing was, like they, I, I, I'm like, yeah, that that's me and Pilates. And I'd be all wrapped up and he'd be, I, I choke myself. Yeah. I, I'm not going to do Pilates. I didn't run today. I should have tomorrow morning. I'll go running. I always have more energy through the whole day. If I go running, you know, two, three miles, something like that. Uh, Oh, you, oh, Gary, you live in New York. Yeah, yeah, New York's a, yeah, I just, I'm not in New York. And the other thing is, what's interesting about New York, and I, I got to go here in a second. Um, in fact, let me just make sure I'm not getting texts. Oh, shoot, okay. I'm good. Oh, shoot, okay. Probably here, sorry. Um, okay. Okay. Um, what's crazy though um, is is like in New York, the studios have amps. Uh, you just bring your guitar and your pedal board, like a small pedal board or something. Uh, you don't bring anything. The studios all have drums, you know. That that's not here. You bring everything that you want to use, you know. Uh, okay, so I've got to get going. Sorry. Oh, Denise. Hey, what's going on? Um, I've got to go because I got someone meeting me here, and we're gonna get some food or lunch or coffee or something. Food or lunch, one of the two. And I have decided we're either gonna get lunch or we're gonna get food. <laughs> Okay. But thanks so much for joining me and making me not feel alone. <laughs> okay. And um, I will uh, I will talk to you guys later and uh, we will try to uh, – so I'll see you on next Monday. I'll probably do a – I may do an overview. I may do the, the blues and minor uh, overlays on these so we can see that. Um, and the, the thing about when you learn the major chord and it's, you know half of the major pentatonic is not going to be true when we – overlay the minor pentatonic. So what I might do is have to try it and then in black dots I'll have the, the pentatonic minor pentatonic so we can see the two together. But okay. Everybody take care. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week, Lord willing. Bye-bye.